on World News Tonight. Laid to rest. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's mortal remains were laid to rest at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Still no speaker. The US House of Representatives failed to elect a speaker yet again. Trouble in the Atlantic. President Putin orders the mobilization of hypersonic missiles on board frigates in the Atlantic Ocean. And frolicking fluff balls. Scoping a look at the daily lifestyles of baby giant pandas as they discover the miracle of life. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Now we have an array of news lined up tonight, but we are starting off with a solemn news. The funeral of former Pope Benedict XVI, who passed away on New Year's Eve at the age of 95, began today in traditional ceremony led by Pope Francis at St. Peter's Square in Vatican City. More than 60,000 people attended the funeral in front of St. Peter's Basilica. Attending the Mass were officials' delegations from Italy and Benedict's native Germany. Other leaders, including the King and Queen of Belgium, the Queen of Spain, and about 13 heads of state or government attended in a private capacity. Most countries will be represented by the ambassadors to the Vatican. The pallbearers carried the coffin of former Pope Benedict away at the end of the funeral Mass. A wave of applause erupted in St. Peter's Square with faithful shouting Santo Sabito, a phrase that means Saint Now in Italian. The coffin was taken back inside the basilica and cased in zinc before being sealed in a second wooden casket. Pope Francis proceeded at the funeral for former Pope Benedict, delivering a homily comparing his predecessor to Jesus before tens of thousands of mourners in St. Peter's Square. To the sound of tolling bells, 12 pallbearers had carried the wooden coffin holding Benedict's remains out of St. Peter's Basilica and placed it on the ground before the largest church in Christendom. After the ceremony, people in crowd cried Saint Now and some waved German and Bavarian flags. Applause broke out across the vast cobbled esplanade, which was shrouded in mist in a sign of respect for Benedict, a hero to Roman Catholic conservatives who shocked the world by resigning nearly a decade ago. In the U.S., as the House gathered again to vote for a speaker, so far six votes have gone to the floors and no one has 218 votes needed to lead the House. While the Republicans are in the majority, they haven't been able to pick their leader. The question now is whether McCarthy will be able to overcome this historic and contentious stalemate. The gridlock on the House floor bring the, brings the Congress to stand still. And to put this into context, this is extremely rare as the House has not gone into multiple ballots for Speaker in 100 years. The U.S. House of Representatives rejected Republican Kevin McCarthy's bid a sixth time for House Speaker Wednesday, leaving the chamber mired in a chaotic leadership battle. Despite a call from former President Donald Trump on Wednesday urging Republicans to back McCarthy, roughly 20 holdouts on the party's right flank, including Colorado Representative Lauren Boebert, refused to back a candidate they deemed unreliable. Even having my favorite president call us and tell us we need to knock this off. I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. McCarthy, the top House Republican since 2019, secured only 201 of the 218 votes needed, while 20 Republicans voted for Florida Representative Byron Donalds. All 212 of the chamber's Democrats voted for their leader, Hakeem Jeffries. The last time the House failed to elect a speaker on the first ballot was a century ago, in 1923. No member elect having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast, a speaker has not been elected. After the sixth vote in two days failed to produce a speaker, lawmakers voted to recess until later in the evening while they seek a solution behind closed doors. The latest COVID-19 subvariant XBB15 is taking over as the dominant strain in the United States. And as the World Health Organization confirms that this subvariant is the most transmissible so far, and countries are ramping up their travel restrictions from China. 
At the beginning of December, only 4% of COVID-19 cases in the United States were from the latest subvariant, XBB15. But in under a month, this strain has overtaken other versions of Omicron, accounting for more than 40% of COVID cases in the U.S., making it the latest dominant strain. On Wednesday, scientists from the World Health Organization confirmed that the XBB15 subvariant has a growth advantage, but said it hasn't yet shown any indication of being more serious or harmful than previous Omicron variants. Um, but what we can say is that it does have a growth advantage um, above all of the other subvariants so far. We don't have any data on severity yet or on the clinical picture, but we also do not have an indication that severity has changed with XBB.1.5. Scientists say that XBB.1.5, like its other XBB relatives, is shown to be the most immune evasive yet. Experts say that what gives it such a growth advantage is that the latest subvariant has a mutation that makes it bind more tightly to cells. Needing more data quickly to get ahead of this fast-changing virus, the WHO Director General called for more effort from China. We continue to ask China for more rapid, regular, reliable data on hospitalizations and deaths, as well as more comprehensive real-time viral sequencing. Countries around the world have been imposing measures on travelers from China. The 27 member states of the European Union have agreed to strongly encourage a requirement that would obligate all travelers coming from China, regardless of nationality, to show a negative COVID-19 test, and also that passengers on flights to and from China wear medical masks or respirators, in addition to other hygiene measures. These recommendations will enter into force as of Monday, January 9th. Here in South Korea, the first case of the XBB15 subvariant was detected on December 8th, and to date, 13 cases have been reported nationwide, of which seven were imported. President Vladimir Putin sent a frigate to the Atlantic Ocean armed with new generation hypersonic cruise missiles, a signal to the West that Russia will not back down in what Moscow calls its special military operation in Ukraine. Russia's latest frigate admiral, Goshkov, with Zirkan hypersonic cruise missiles on board, embarked on long-distance mission. Before the warship's departure, Russian President Vladimir Putin heard reports by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and the frigate's commander via video link, the Kremlin said in a press release. The modern multipurpose vessel, which is capable of pinpoint and powerful strikes against naval and ground targets, would sail across the Atlantic Ocean and Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. The Zircon missiles, which can fly at a speed of over Mach 9 and cover a range of over 1,000 kilometers, are able to penetrate any air and missile defense system, according to him. The mission is aimed at countering any threats to Russia, maintaining regional peace and stability together with friendly countries, Shoigu said, adding that the crew would practice to use the hypersonic weapons and long-range cruise missiles in various environmental conditions. The high-profile tests have come despite Moscow suffering heavy losses of men and equipment in its near-year-long invasion of Ukraine, which has seen relations between Russia and the West plummet. Despite their names, analysts had said that the main feature of hypersonic weapons is not speed, which can sometimes be matched or exceeded by traditional ballistic missile warheads, but their maneuverability. The weapons are seen as a way to gain an edge over any adversary as they can potentially evade missile shields and early warning systems. Over to some business news now. Amazon.com layoffs will now increase to more than 18,000 roles as part of a workforce reduction in previously disclosed. Chef executive Andy Jassy has said that in a public staff note, adding that affected staff will be notified starting January 18th. The head of Amazon says the company is upping its layoffs to more than 18,000 roles cut. That number, announced by Chief Executive Andy Jassy in a note on Wednesday, is higher than what sources told and other media reported last year. Jassy said it will largely impact the company's e-commerce and human resources organizations, and that the company will start reaching out to affected staff from January 18. The cuts amount to 6% of Amazon's roughly 300,000-person corporate workforce. It also represents a swift turn for the online retail giant after recently doubling its base pay ceiling to compete more aggressively for talent. Jassy said in the note that annual planning, quote, has been more difficult given the uncertain economy and that we've hired rapidly over the last several years. 
After a big pandemic boom, Amazon has braced for likely slower growth as soaring inflation encouraged businesses and consumers to cut back spending. Its share price has halved in the past year. Alexa. The company began letting staff go in November from its devices division, with a source telling that at the time it was targeting around 10,000 cuts. Jassy said Amazon chose to disclose the news before informing affected staff because of a leak. His note on Wednesday followed a report in the Wall Street Journal that the layoffs involved more than 17,000 jobs. Amazon still must file certain legal notices about mass layoffs and says it plans to pay severance. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, a tragic incident was reported this week in Australia as the excitement of a SeaWorld helicopter ride turned to shock and dread in a matter of seconds after takeoff. We have other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip joining us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy, has there been an update on the cause of the incident? Yes, Shanali. A video appears to show a survivor of the deadly helicopter collision had tried to warn a pilot of impending danger. In the footage, a passenger in the backseat of the aircraft is seen tapping the pilot's shoulder. Pilot Michael James turns his head in response, while the passenger then grips his seat. The helicopter and another collided a moment later, killing a UK couple and two Australians on the aircraft. The footage was filmed on board a SeaWorld sightseeing helicopter that was descending on the Gold Coast on Monday afternoon. Investigators say they are still trying to find out what caused the mid-air collision, including the situation in the two cockpits. Thank you, Timothy, for that update. And now let's hope that the affected victims get some answers soon. On the other hand, Australia was also hit by unprecedented floods with rescue efforts still underway, isn't it, Timothy? That's right, Chenali. Towns in the Western Australia's north are being threatened as the Kimberley flood emergency intensifies. Homes are being inundated, leaving residents stranded, and there are fears supplies are running critically low. The Australian Defence Force has sent three aircraft to the region as the one in a hundred year event remains far from over. Broome is being smashed by heavy rain and gale force winds, with authorities predicting the holiday hotspot will be cut off by today. Roebuck planes quickly went under with all the bottle shops in the tropical town shut. The airport is also out of action until further notice. Meanwhile, the town of Derby looks more like a river as flood water inundates the community. The situation is making matters worse for Fitzroy Crossing residents who are stranded in a one in a hundred year flood emergency. Rapid damage assessment teams have also been deployed to the Kimberley region, but it could take months before the real extent of the damage is known. Bureau of Meteorology Western Australia, manager James Ashley said, it is probably one of the highest flow rates that we've ever seen in Australian rivers. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Timothy Philip, other than a World News Special Correspondent, reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Temperature records tumbled as unseasonable warm weather blew across Europe over the new year, stirring calls from activists for fast action against climate change while offering short-term respite to the government struggling with sky-high gas prices. It's beach weather in parts of southern Europe. In January, swimmers and sunbathers were out Wednesday in the Spanish resort of Malaga. That as temperature records tumble across the continent. Over New Year in Bilbao, in northern Spain, the mercury hit 25.1 Celsius, or about 77 Fahrenheit. Ski resorts in the region are shut due to a lack of snow. The warmth left tourists outside the Guggenheim Museum with mixed feelings. It's like nice weather for biking, but we know it's like the planet is burning, so <laughs> we're enjoying it, but at the same time, yeah, we're scared. <laughs> Many see the warm weather as further evidence of climate change. Greenpeace says the January heat wave is proof that it's time to end dependence on fossil fuels. But the warmth also offers some relief for European governments. They've been struggling to cope with soaring gas prices following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now the hot spell has reduced demand for gas for heating, 
sending energy costs lower again. On Wednesday, Europe's benchmark gas price had dropped back to pre-war levels. Italy's energy authority, for one, has predicted bills will fall as a result. That should mean European governments don't have to spend as much on capping charges for consumers. In Bilbao, locals just aren't sure what to make of it all. It's not normal, says this man. It should be cold and rainy at this time of year. Over to some dramatic news with the royals. Now, Prince Harry has claimed that his brother Prince William physically attacked him, which uh, says that it has seen a copy of the Duke's upcoming memoir, Spare. The newspaper reported that the book sets out an argument between the pair over Prince Harry's wife, Meghan. Kensington Palace said that it has no comment to make. Buckingham Palace, which represents the household of the king, has yet to respond to request for comment. The memoir will not be published until next Tuesday, but a British news source obtained a copy amid what it called stringent pre-launch security. The book says the row was sparked by comments Prince William made to Prince Harry at his London home in 2019. Prince Harry writes that his brother was critical of his marriage to Meghan Markle and that Prince William described her as difficult, rude and abrasive. The Duke of Sussex reportedly write that his brother was parroting the press narrative as the confrontation escalated. Prince Harry writes that his brother urged him to hit back and he refused to do so, but Prince William later looked regretful and apologised. While publishers at Penguin Random House are yet to confirm whether he leaked excerpts from the book are genuine, Prince Harry has recently spoken to his troubled relationship with his brother. This revelation comes as Prince Harry earlier this week said that he quote unquote wanted his brother and father back after months of suspected bad blood between the Duke of Sussex, the Prince of Wales and the King himself. We have some good news for you. Many attempts are being made to further incorporate drones into city life. In the South Korean city of Sejong, a project is underway to develop drones that can help contain fires and manage traffic. This drone slowly approaches a piece of glass on a metal frame. With the slightest of touches from the small pointy tip, the glass instantly shatters into pieces. The glass that just broke is 12 millimeter thick tempered glass most commonly used in skyscrapers. It produces a liquid that's made to extinguish fire from midair. It's been designed specifically and locally for firefighting. The demonstration trials were originally supposed to get underway on top of a second-story building, but an issue with the GPS got in the way. For the second year straight, Sejong City is running a project to establish tangible ways drones can be used in the city. City officials say their continuous work has enabled their public traffic managing drones to have autonomous flying functions and have improved their road condition detecting accuracy from 70% last year to 90% this year. In the case of patrolling drones, they are now equipped with anti-crash sensors, which helps them avoid crashing into structures and buildings. The drones made for delivery are advanced enough to drop packages while airborne. The city plans to extend the special unrestricted drone zone, which is slated to expire next June, and continue expediting the developments of cutting-edge drone technologies. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's go see around the world in a minute. Myanmar's military government will release over 7,000 prisoners under an amnesty to mark the country's Independence Day as the junta chief praised some countries for maintaining support for his nation. PSG player Lionel Messi was welcomed with a guard of honour after a 17-day hiatus following his World Cup victory with Argentina's national soccer team. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak promised to tackle Britain's most pressing problems from cutting inflation to ending illegal migration in a speech aimed at reassuring critics within his restive Conservative Party. Chinese President Xi Jinping said that China is ready to resume oil and gas talks and manage maritime issues cordially with the Philippines, despite Beijing's territorial claims in the South China Sea, which had led the source of tension between it and some Southeast Asian countries, including the Philippines. With vandalized headstones behind him at a Jerusalem Protestant cemetery, Archbishop of the Anglican Church, Hossam Nayom, said that he hoped that the Jewish extremists responsible will be brought to justice. Israel police said that they were investigating the vandalization of gravestones at the Protestant Mount Zion Cemetery.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, it's always good to end things on a positive note. Therefore, we are wrapping up tonight with fluff balls frolicking away in their habitats. Stay safe and have a good night.